This is section 5.4, Indefinite Integrals and the Net Change Theorem. Our first objective is to understand indefinite integrals and how they differ from definite integrals. When we're done, I'd like you to be able to explain why we don't have integral rules for going backwards on inverse cosine, inverse cotangent, and inverse cosecant of x. Remember that we just spent a week working with section 5.3, that fundamental theorem of calculus. And let's recall, too, that the fundamental theorem of calculus connected the two branches of calculus. So we had differentiation and integration, which initially began as an accumulation. But with that fundamental theorem of calculus, we saw that the accumulation operation of integration is actually the same as the inverse of a derivative. So what that means for us is that now we can take the accumulation connotation of that integral symbol away and we can work instead with just the integral symbol by itself. When I have numbers at the bottom and top, I'm looking for the actual accumulation of a function and it's the limit of that Riemann sum. But when I take the numbers away, now this symbol starts to have a new meaning. And that meaning is called an indefinite integral. And that indefinite integral is going to represent the set of all antiderivatives of a function. So if we wrote this right here, the integral of f of x with respect to x, and we know that it equals capital F of x plus c, we would read the indefinite integral of little f with respect to x is big F of x plus c. And the reason that is the case is because big F, when we take the derivative of it, gives us the little f. So when we are solving problems of this type, and we want to evaluate an indefinite integral, then what we will do is we will answer the question, what did I take the derivative of with respect to x that gave me little f of x? And the answer is going to be an entire family of curves. So we need to make sure that you can distinguish between a definite integral and an indefinite integral. Definite integrals have limits of integration on the top and bottom, whereas an indefinite integral just has the integral symbol alone. A definite integral will represent an accumulation, so it will be a number, whereas an indefinite integral will be an entire family of functions. So if you look in your notes, you'll see that we have reviewed all of the basic derivative rules, and then we rewrite that rule using an integral symbol instead. So if we look just at this first one, it would say the derivative of capital F of x equals little f. So the inverse way to write that is to say, what did I take the derivative of with respect to x that gave me little f? Well, it was big F of x plus c. So if you look here, we have our three basic rules about the relationships between derivatives and antiderivatives. We have our constant rule. We have our sum and difference rule. Then we have our power rule going forward and what it looks like when we go backwards. Notice we brought our exponent down in front and then subtracted one from the exponent. So when we go backwards, we're going to have to add one to that exponent and then divide by the new power. And we never forget that plus c. We have an n that cannot be negative 1 because when n is negative 1, then we're looking at something on the inside that would be the derivative of a log natural. So then we have these four exponential and log rules and we need to be able to go forward and backwards in all four of these. We've got our trig rules. Then we have our inverse trig rules. Now notice, to help you get at that language objective, Notice the relationship between the derivative of sine inverse and the derivative of cosine inverse. You should be able to see here why we don't need to have a rule going backwards on this derivative of cosine inverse. With example one now, we are going to practice going backwards with this integral symbol. We're going to compute some indefinite integrals by answering the question, what did I take the derivative of with respect to x that gave me this inner function? So we're going to use the fact that this coefficient can be put inside or outside. And then we're going to realize that inside I have something that the power rule has been applied to. So we've got to go backwards with the power rule by adding 1 to the exponent and then dividing by the new exponent plus c. You can write that as a single coefficient out in front if you like, or you could do 2x to the fifth all over 5. 
If we look here now at part B, we see that there's a constant or a coefficient that can come out in front. And you'd like, you want to get into the habit of rewriting whatever's inside so that it looks like the derivative of something. So I'm going to take that root on the bottom and convert it to a power because I know that in order to get that root on the bottom I had to take the derivative of something that had a power. So now to go backwards I will answer the question by adding 1 to the exponent and then dividing by the new exponent. If I simplify now I'll have a 10 root x plus c. Now remember at any time that you can double check yourself by taking the derivative of this and you should get back to what was inside the indefinite integral. This one we have one, two, three, four, five things so I'm going to do each one of these separately. We'll have the pi sine of x, we'll have the five to the x, the minus one over x, and then this one we're going to multiply out so that we can see that it's a power rule applied. So to go backwards now, we'll move through the coefficient, we'll answer the question what did I take the derivative of that gave me sine and that's negative cosine. What did I take the derivative of with respect to x that gave me 5 to the x? Well, I've got to go backwards on a power rule. When I go forwards on a power rule where the base is not e, I have to multiply by that log natural of that base. But because I'm going backwards, I'm going to divide by the log natural of that base. Going backwards on this one, I see that that is the derivative of a log natural of the absolute value of x. Don't forget the absolute values because remember the domain of this cannot be smaller than the domain of this. And since the derivative allows me to put in negatives, that means the function it came from had better allow me to put in negatives. Next, this is a simple power rule. And the last one is also a power rule. We add 1 to the power and divide by the new exponent. Add plus c and we are finished.